Uh, welcome to the very first Let's Talk Art. And my name is Kelly Mealy, if you don't know me. Hi, I'm the Educational Engagement Coordinator. And in a moment here, we're going to be listening in on a conversation between the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts Director, Sarah Hall, and the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts Curator, Daniel Falco. And they're going to be presenting to us for a while. You'll notice that you don't have um, the capability to speak right now because of the webinar format. So if you look over, uh, you'll see, well, it's probably underneath your Zoom chat bar there, your Zoom bar at the bottom. Find the little chat bubble and you're welcome to click on that and ask your questions there. Or if you have technical difficulties, we can try to help out as much as we can. Um, Jillian McMaster and myself, we are going to be here, but you're not gonna see us. However, Jillian and I are going to be kind of looking over your questions and fielding to see what you all are saying. And when it's appropriate, we will interject during the presentation and ask uh, either Sarah and or Daniel your question. And then we'll also at the very end, we'll have a question and answer session where Daniel and Sarah can go through and uh, kind of search through the questions and anything they didn't get to during the presentation, there'll be time at the end there. So I hope you all enjoy the program. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Sarah now. And I'm going to disappear, but I'm here. And so is Jillian. <laughs> nice to know you're with us. <laughs> Helping out. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to be here with us on Zoom tonight. This is always um, a little bit of an adventure, everybody being in separate places, hoping the technology works. Um, and I did want to say um, very pointedly, I'm stealing this from another museum, but welcome to the museum because in today's world, um, the museum is where we are. Um, we realized really quickly back in March when everyone had to shut their doors that we still needed to serve the public. We still needed to make connections to our collections, um, reach out to people. Uh, Kelly and Jillian and Daniel worked really hard all summer providing content related to the collections. Daniel's been recording videos. Kelly's been creating Art A Day challenges. Um, really making the museum be much more than a building. Making the museum be the connections that we make with you. And the positive thing about this world is that it allows us to make connections much farther away. So um, while some of you may never have been to the museum or have only then years ago, um, we can still connect you with the collection um, this way. So it's, it's, I think, here to stay. We all need to adapt to this new way of reaching audiences, and it just enriches what we do. Um, so I'm really happy to be here and be part of the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts and to help inaugurate this new program. Um, a few things I wanted to mention myself that um, tonight's program is intended to be um, kind of entertainment. I said, we called it Let's, Let's Talk Art, but tonight we're kind of doing Let's Talk About Ourselves because I was thinking about how I need to get, my new, get to know my new staff, how I need to learn the collection, and the kinds of conversations that I would have with Daniel. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if people could eavesdrop? So you could kind of pretend we're having lunch together or something um, if it was uh, regular times <laughs> and that you get to eavesdrop on some of the things that we're asking each other about. Um, so I, I would, would say that at the end or even now as we're talking, if you think of good ideas for future conversations, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, it could be a conversation about one particular artwork. It could be a conversation about issues in the museum field. Um, we're kind of open to following um, the needs of others as well as our own interests. So go ahead and do that if you want to. Um, and uh, one thing Kelly didn't mention um, in her um, introduction as we went over Zoom is if you don't Zoom often, you can adjust your view. So I recommend actually when Daniel pulls up the PowerPoint, because he's got to do double duty and run, run the um, program as well as talk, um, you can go up to the top and change it to a side-by-side -side view. And then you'll see the two of us in small boxes next to a full display of 
the images. So I think that's probably um, a recommended view for when we're talking about this. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to say before we kick into the program is I'm going to do what the teachers do and dance for me. And we really hope if you have the ability to make a gift, um, you do so on that day when the gift will go a little farther for us. Uh, we're in a, a situation where the American Alliance of Museums is predicting that 30% of museums could close because of loss of revenue during COVID. I am one of the things that I take um, great pleasure and pride in about this new position is that we're free. Um, we have been free to the community since 1931. Um, that makes us a bit less revenue dependent, but we still have also taken a hit and, um, you know, a monkey wrench in our budget and whatever you can do will really help us um, continue our work this year um, and continue to try to innovate and create ways of connecting you with the collection. Um, and I also want to say we're, we are open, you know, amazingly, um, you know, hosting temporary exhibitions. I was so impressed when I came and, you know, already basically two new shows had been installed um, within, you know, a week of the museum reopening. So I'm confident you can visit the museum safely, um, you know, in small groups and with your masks on. Um, and it's a wonderful, it's better than going to the grocery store. <laughs> not, not quite the ordeal that going to the grocery store is. And it, and it makes you feel good to go out and do something that's more like regular life again. So um, that said, um, I am going to, se to say also um, that one of my favorite things in the new job is writing thank you letters. So I will happily um, write, write thank you letters to anybody who, um, gives a donation on Washington County Gives Day on Tuesday. So we are um, largely unscripted tonight. We have a sort of template for what we're doing that we use to create images. Um, but I, do, I have a few notes, um, but not many. So we're going to see what happens. Um, I'm going to let Daniel start the slideshow, and we will dive in for tonight. OK, thank you, uh, Sarah. Let me just share my uh, screen with everybody. And it's such an untraditional thing, I will say, and that nobody has read our resumes. <laughs> so I didn't give you a proper introduction, but we'll learn a lot about each other while we talk. Yes. Okay, so this is our first question. How did you get involved with museums? So uh, I think Daniel has an answer first. Yes. Well, for me, it begins back when I was in high school. And the images on the left here, this is my uh, hometown high school, Glastonbury High. And this um, person up here is Deb Willard, who was my history teacher in high school. And she was one of the first people who introduced me to the uh, history of, of uh, you know, Western culture, but particularly uh, art history, because when I graduated, she gave me a gift of a book about the survey of Western art. And that was one way in which I was really inspired to study art. And that happened throughout my period uh, as I was a high school student. And I had a very inspirational trip back in 1998 to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which is shown here on the right. And at that time, the building wasn't very old. Now, now it's gotten older, but it was a new addition and it was a light filled space. It was so inspirational. It was a part of a family vacation going to visit relatives. But we went to this museum and I was so impressed by the modern art that was on the walls that when I came back to my hometown, I delved into the books in the high school library and really got into art as a whole. But it's very interesting because I actually entered the field studying and looking at modern art because this space was so inspirational in San Francisco. So I credit a lot of my formative interest in history and culture to Deb Willard. So I will interrupt. I'll let you keep going. But when you sure. talked about um, delving in because of contemporary art, one of the things that I have discovered myself is, you know, art is a fantastic conversation starter and gets people 
thinking and connecting with the real world. And I remember taking my son when he was about four to the Carnegie in Pittsburgh when they were doing their the International, which is, you know, a huge survey of contemporary art. And just responding to his questions about, you know, what was this and what are the artists doing and what does this mean, mom, really opens up this huge engagement with issues that are, you know, of importance to everyone. So how good for you to be a young guy and to go that path on your own. Yes, absolutely, Sarah. And my, my parents, I should also credit them too. They were absolutely critical that since I was very young, they would bring us to museums, but it wasn't until I got older that I began to uh, gain an appreciation for art, especially in that 1998 visit to SF MoMA. So that's also uh, part of how I got interested in all of this. And then it sort of took shape. It all came together when I was an, un an undergrad student at Connecticut College. And here's a picture of the lovely campus in New London. Some of you may have visited it before. It's beautiful. It's right along Long Island Sound. New London is an old whaling city. It was in its heyday a major center of commerce in uh, the 18th and 19th centuries. And it's along the southeast coast of Connecticut. And in the photo in the background here, you can see the Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guard Academy there. So I went to school right next to there. There's the, they call it the Thames River, not Thames. And I took my classes in that building in the back there, the Cummings Arts Center. So it was here that I really got taught by some fabulous people um, about art history. Number one was my academic advisor at that time, Joe Alkermes, who's in this photo here. Chris Steiner, who was the head of the Museum Studies program at Connecticut College, and that was a fabulous opportunity. Robert Baldwin, who taught uh, Northern European art. Constance Sherrock, she was my French literature professor, but she took an, exam an interest in how we examine the museum and read it as a text. Very interesting stuff I learned from her. Great inspiration. And then here's a, 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 my one of my mentors who was... Uh, his name is Gene Gaddis, and he used to be the archivist at the Wadsworth f and Museum of Art. And that's where I had my first formal internship in an art museum. And the Wadsworth f and is the oldest art museum in the country, founded in 1842 by Daniel Wadsworth. We have so, to introduce a great um, book recommendation, um, the, the Chick Austin book. Um, I'm yes. blanking on the title. What's the name? The, the something, The Magician of the Modern? Is that it? The Magician of the Modern, yes, authored by Jean here. Ah. So Jean authored that book, and I spent the summer with him in the archives of the Athenaeum. And it was really an, a very inspirational um, period of study with him that summer. It, it involved unearthing in the archives an Arshal Gorky drawing that uh, belonged in the collections but somehow got buried in the archival material. So that was a fun discovery. Um, cool. So it was all of these people, particularly Joe Alcorn is here. Joe was an outstanding lecturer and he really brought the life, it brought the art to life. And I'll never forget sitting in his survey class as a freshman and sort of feeling how uh, intimidating the subject could be as we looked at the ancient Egyptian monuments. But that's where it all began for me, this freshman year there. And then also doing some work and taking classes at the Lyman Allen Art Museum, which is a museum that the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts has exchanged pieces with in its history. I should point that out. And the Lyman Allen is in certain ways similar to WCMF terms of its encyclopedic collection. So that's sort of how I got, that's how I sort of got into this. And then once I graduated from college, I got a job working as assistant curator and assistant uh, to this uh, gentleman here on the right, Douglas Highland, who was the longtime director of the New Britain Museum of American Art in Connecticut. New Britain, as some of you may know, it was the headquarters of Stanley Tools. So it was a manufacturing town. It shares many similarities with Hagerstown, actually. So when I, we'll get there later, but when I arrived in Hagerstown, I noticed the similarities between the collections, but also the cities have a certain connection. And what's interesting is WCMFA has had uh, loan exchanges with this place for which I used to work. And Douglas was quite the mentor to me. I still keep in touch with him. And 
He's now retired, but he had a very successful uh, time there. And he taught me really so much about American art and about museum practice. I, I owe a great deal to him. I'll introduce you with that. With that. Uh, rumor has it not the easiest person to work for. So but before I came here, um, colleagues said to me, well, if he succeeded working along Doug Highland, then he's, he's going to be a great colleague. So, Absolutely, Sarah. He was very fast paced and he um, had, a, had very many expectations. He was highly energetic and driven. So definitely the case, but rewarding experience to work with him. So that's sort of the beginnings of how I found my way to Hagerstown into the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. Great story. Yes, and some of, just some of the, paint, the works at New Britain that are very similar to the collections at, in Hagerstown. Or the, it's a beautiful West Rock, New Haven here by Frederick Edwin Church, an early one very similar to the one that we have of the Catskill Creek at our museum. And then on the lower right, Child Hassam's um, Le Jour de Grand Prix, which is, shows this uh, sort of carefree Parisian life in the 1880s. It's a wonderful painting. And I'll turn it over to you, sir. Okay. Well, <laughs> this is um, kind of this, a bit of the story of my childhood in that my dad was a science museum director. And honestly, this is what I thought people's family pictures looked like because nobody really took snapshots. They were all museum publicity photos. Um, so you can see the contact sheet on the left, which also includes some kind of a dig, some kind of a, um, you know, dig for fossils um, going on in the bottom left of the contact sheet. And then um, various, uh, you know, me, me with the globe. You can see the huge stanchions that they moved to the side so that they could let me be in right next to the globe. Um, but I'm about two in this picture. And so I really, um, my dad died when I was quite young. Um, so these days of feeling completely at home in a museum were few, but incredibly um, indelible. I've, you know, everybody knows that the press release, I think, um, when I got this appointment, tells the story. And I thought that, you know, the Triceratops was named after me. Um, <laughs> I just felt completely at home in, in a museum setting. And I understood as I grew up that that was an amazing privilege, that every kid should feel really comfortable in museums and have that sense of adventure and discovery and, you know, uh, Ultimately, it would be really nice if they all felt like the museum was a second home. You can go ahead and um, move forward, Daniel. So these are just some more family photos. You can see me and my mom and dad. On the left, that was a uh, feature in the Sunday Magazine section of the local paper. Um, dad was walking a nature trail and um, they were photo documenting us. And my mom, Catherine on the right, she was a big sewer. And you can see I'm sort of dressed like Little Red Riding Hood and I'm also holding a matching doll. <laughs> so. Uh, that was a fun, um, fun uh, little uh, museum feature uh, in the paper. And I love the pictures from that day. And on the right, um, the woman is examining a mastodon tooth on the left and dad is touching the artifact, <laughs> which in 1960, whatever, apparently wasn't as frowned upon as it is now. So I always get mad too, if you watch Antiques Roadshow and they don't have their gloves on, I always think, you know, there are times when clean hands are better than gloves, but I always think if you're on TV, set a good example. You can quote me on that. Okay, you can go to the next one. And this is, my dad was actually a pioneer in children's museums. And um, had he lived, his dream was to retire to somewhere warmer than Buffalo, New York, which is where we were, and to um, open and run a children's museum. So he was doing a lot of research into children's museums. And there was one opened as an annex to the Buffalo Museum of Science in the late 60s. And um, you can see uh, that I got the privilege of holding those big scissors and clipping the ribbon. And I remember being really annoyed at that woman who was telling me, you know, be really careful. And I was thinking, I know how to use these scissors. So um, also another dress sewn by my mom. <laughs> You can move forward from there. And um, so, you know, I'll wrap that up before we get into exhibitions with the fact that my path to museums was not intentional 
you, in spite of that childhood of loving museums, I went to college and studied um, communication. Um, I actually worked for the college television, television station. I went to graduate school and studied film and video and creative writing. I've written some poetry, but I did start hanging out with artists in graduate school and getting involved in exhibition work. And, you know, spending a lot of time, I, when I started working at the Frick, which we'll see, you know, it was funny to me because here I was dealing with these like Trocento paintings and this, you know, uh, pretty alien, um, distant art history when I hung out with installation artists and um, painters and, you know, th that was my milieu. So um, if we go into actually um, exhibition work, I will say that I, my first trip to Pittsburgh in 1989, uh, um, I drove straight to Pittsburgh Center for the Arts because my husband had an exhibition there. So perhaps that was my first exhibition work. Um, didn't start working professionally in museums for another five years, um, but uh, it, it, it ended up happening. So um, go ahead and forward through the slides, Daniel, and we'll take this conversation back to New Britain with Daniel, and we'll get back to me in a minute. Yes, my first show at New Britain was not long after I arrived there 15 years ago, and it was an exhibition called Innocence, which explored different aspects of childhood from infancy all the way through uh, adolescence. And it was a lone exhibition. There were works that came from regional museums and private collections in and around Connecticut, including the Addison Gallery of American Art at the Phillips Academy. Some of you may know of that up in Andover, Massachusetts. They have a wonderful collection. And then this one here, which is a lovely Winslow Homer watercolor uh, girl that was loaned by the Chase family of, of Hartford. And uh, it was really a formative experience for me in terms of learning how to put together a show and give tours of it, do research on the works and write labels. And this was all done in the old building of the New Britain Museum. So this is before it expanded. A year later, and I'll come back to that afterwards, we would expand the art museum significantly, with the new building and proper collection storage. So that was my first one. Okay, and look at me, cheated. <laughs> so what was your first exhibition? And my answer is three. So the first exhibition I really worked on was at Pittsburgh Center for the Arts. So I mentioned visiting there in 1989. When I moved to Pittsburgh in 1994, they were looking for a temporary maternity leave replacement for their exhibition coordinator. And um, I had no idea that 70 people applied for this three month job, which somehow um, I, it was complete nepotism because I had met the curator, um, you know, in 1989. Um, and I got that job and it was really fun, a fun adventure because I was really just plunged right into a lot of work. It was the first Pittsburgh Biennial. You can't really read that catalog cover on the left, but it does you know, black on black. That's Murray Horn for you. He's now the curator of Wood Street Galleries in Pittsburgh and does some really innovative international programming there. But at the time he was at Pittsburgh Center for the Arts and it was 14 um, local artists all doing different things and 14 different personalities um, and 14 levels of installation to manage from construction of a giant wooden rose in the park that um, actually Chris Fetter, who was my landlord at the time, built and um, Bob Bingham, who did something called urban, I think it was urban semi-wilderness area and all these trees were brought in and, and planted in Mellon Park adjacent to the um, into the gallery in, in an hourglass shape with this whole metaphorical, you know, walking through nature transition. Um, and then we had phot photographs and, um, you know, it was just a huge range of artists and personalities. And um, I didn't really know until I was involved in that, that I had good logistical management skills and that I had good personality management skills. So that was a great experience. And then when I went to the Frick, um, the first show we did there was Medieval Art in America um, that I was involved with from the Palmer Museum. And I'd like to mention this because it was truly, um, you know, ivories and reliquaries with jewels, 
um, architectural capitals. It was like opening treasure chests, like Indiana Jones movie kind of treasure chest. So it was incredibly exciting. And I was really nervous about, you know, handling these medieval objects. And I, I had done all this reading, um, you know, the, the Met has a little guide to art handling. And um, it, it, it was, and there were couriers from everywhere traveling with this show. So it was a, an immersion in uh, kind of major exhibition lo logistics and meeting a lot of experts. Um, which was really interesting. And then um, major, really influential exhibition that the Frick did, which was self-organized. So the medieval art show was a traveling show, you know, that we um, put on, but collecting in the Gilded Age was um, a Frick show entirely. And the publication is still incredibly influential. Um, I, I learned a lot. You will see later a picture of Linda Benedict Jones, who worked on this catalog coordinating the production of the catalog with me. So neither of us did any writing for it, but just dealing with designers and writers and all of the images and getting them in order. Um, I really learned that sometimes um, you may be fa fast paced and high energy, but sometimes you have to stop and be really thorough and really deliberate and do things right the first time or you're gonna have a mess to straighten out. And I really learned that from Linda working on this catalog. Um, and, and it was a fantastic exhibition too. Um, it's a shame that it didn't travel. It was, you know, so many loans from so many places um, and it was really difficult to pull off even just in that one venue. So that's enough about my three first exhibitions. All right, and we've heard a little bit about influential people in our lives now, but um, already, but we can, we can see what's going on here. So I guess um, we probably saw Daniel's influential people um, already, although he may want to revisit them. Um, I have here um, four people, you know, there's obviously many more and so many really fascinating speakers I've met and writers, but um, top left is Sheena Wagstaff, who's now the chair of contemporary art at the Met. And she actually was my first boss in the curatorial department in Pittsburgh. And in fact, when I started working at the Frick, I was a part-time person, um, I, I tell this story a lot too, um, they were keeping track of tour, there's a historic house there, and they were keeping track of the tours in a date book. You know, people would call and say a bus of 45 people was coming and they'd write it in a date book. And every once in a while, something wouldn't get written down and a bus would show up and there was nobody there to help them. And so they had a task force, write a position description and choose scheduling software. And that's what they hired me to do. And so that's a thing I never expected to do in my life is go to a job and have a box with a computer on the desk and a box with a manual and figure out how to set up this <laughs> scheduling software. But Sheena was there and part of the task force and we I went through the job interview process and met her in that way and she knew um, I had she actually written for that Pittsburgh biennial catalog so she I had, had coordinated that with her um, and she knew me and she started asking me to do curatorial projects and the first thing she asked me to do was to design a um, installation for World AIDS Day the day without art that did not necessarily involved just covering a painting with a black cloth, which is what traditionally they were doing. This is 1996, I think. And um, so I did concepts for three different installations over a three year period. And by after the first one, basically she brought me into curatorial as soon as they had a vacancy there. And I worked with her for two and a half years. Um, and uh, she's amazing. And she went on to, you know, be one of the founding curators of Tate Modern. She went back to London and now she's at the Met. And then on the right is Dick McIntosh, who was that incredible kind perfectionist in my life. Like, you know, Dick ha could hold astonishing amounts of information in his brain and just rattle them off in meetings and, and in a dazzling way. Um, very high standards, um, not, also not an easy person to get along with. When I applied for my job at the Frick, they said, well, you won't have to report to the <laughs> to the director so you'll probably be okay but you know i had a great relationship with dick and great respect for him and that level of perfectionism really um he was the, the founding director because the frick art museum was open from 1970 to 1990 but the historic house didn't open until 1990 so when it, helen clay frick dies in 1984 dick came in to 
to create the entire um, five and a half acre frick. And then on the bottom left is Linda Benedict Jones, who I mentioned about the catalog. She was the former curator of the Polaroid collection in Boston, who came to Pittsburgh and ran our education department um, and worked with me on the Gilded Age catalog and taught me about deliberation and care and methodicalness. Not that I'm not a methodical person anyway, but sometimes when you're young and working, you can really get caught up in the stress of a moment. And she really, really did teach me to the, the importance of deliberation when you need it. Um, and Phil Bodine on the bottom right, who um, is retired now, um, but worked with me at the Frick for I think 11, 12 years as my director. Um, and really, um, you know, good um, bosses are talent managers and they help you discover abilities you didn't know you had. And Bill always trusted me to do more and differently than I ever realized I could. So that's enough <laughs> about me. We can, we can move on. I just want to interject and give you a little heads up. It is 629. Okay. Kind All right. Well, you yeah, we talk a lot. I talk a lot. <laughs> Okay, so um, what's the next slide, Daniel? We will try to speed our pace up. Okay, favorite pieces in the collection of, of the Washington County MFA or anything that you find particularly compelling. I said that because the word favorite is awful and also I have favorites on different days and different times, different moods, <laughs> I think. So I put the Moran in here because when I first went in the gallery, it just kind of knocked my socks off um, for lack of a, a more professional sounding term. And I'm familiar with Moran's National Park views, but you know, this incredible um, American scene, urban scene um, with its hints of Turner and you can tell the reverence for Turner in this. Um, and, and it's gorgeous as a whole painting, the atmosphere, but it's just completely delightful to scrutinize up close as well. So you just go on. I have some details on the next page. We won't talk about them, but it's, it's gorgeous. It's a stunning painting. And I uh, just to add there, it was the first painting that the museum purchased in 1940. Yes. All right, what a good, what a good decision that was. I yes, <laughs> director John Kraft bought that one. Mm -hmm. For me, so one of my real favorites is the in our Smith Gallery is the Thomas Birch shipwreck of 1837. This is just a tour de force of um, it, dealing with the sublime, but also the struggle of humans for survival here with their ship, which is run aground, and then this cliff that almost looks like it's going to swallow up the mariners. So it's really one of my favorites. And then in another. All-time yeah. favorite of mine is the Godfrey Schalken self-portrait of the artist with a candle from 1694. And this right. just I love the light in this painting, and also his attitude is wonderful. Yeah. Yes, he's so self-confident and um, really uh, sort of uh, showing off his status at that point in his career. Okay, so um, favorite artists or works that aren't necessarily in the collection. We'll breeze through this. So this is my dad's. Uh, so when we went through and talked about um, influences, um, I didn't mention that my dad had an art background. He took art classes. He was a scientific illustrator and ran the model department for Ward's Natural Science Establishment in Rochester, New York for a number of years um, and was known, he, you know, he was a an all around naturalist, but he was really known as an ornithologist. Um, but I have this little squirrel in my house um, of my dad's. And so he's one of my favorite artists who's not in the collection. And then I think the next slide has a whole bunch and I'll just rattle through them fast. Ah, this is, this is the Albright Knox, the um, mirrored room, which I remember visiting when I was like three years old. So, and that's, you know, was, my dad was really active, um, you know, knew all the board members of the Albright Knox. In fact, the Van Gogh sunflower painting that the Albright Knox had for years and has since been sold, um, belonged to the Museum of Science. <laughs> which is why it was so, so there was this inner relationship. And so I did spend time at the Albright Knox as well. And I thought this was just enchanting when I was a child. 
And that's my husband. So um, I did mention that I first went to Pittsburgh for an exhibition of his work in 1989. Um, he's a painter and a printmaker um, who does mostly photography these days. And um, that's an essay I wrote about his work. So if anybody's interested, that's online. You can find that and, and read it. And then just, um, you know, I love Courbet, I, the Bellini. Uh, so Giovanni de Paolo is top left. That's a fantastic painting in the Frick's collection in Pittsburgh. I, ha I have an incredible soft spot for um, Gustave Courbet. And so I picked Bonjour Monsieur Courbet because I think that's a painting with a lot of attitude. And uh, to the right of that is Bellini St. Francis, which some people think is the most beautiful painting in the world. Um, it is pretty magical for sure. Um, and what else do I have on there? Durer's hair, which I did get to see in the basement of the Albertina. Um, I was there and they said, can we show you anything? And, and they pulled out some volumes of his Alpine studies. And I said, you know, while I'm here, you need to show me the hair. <laughs> so they did open it up and show me the hair. And then the other image on the bottom left is Emile Lafermiere, which is one of the um, 10 Millet works on paper that um, Henry Clay Frick bought that are in the collection in Pittsburgh. It's the second largest collection of Millet works on paper in the country, um, at least his um, pastels. Um, and it's exquisite. Um, the color is not really good in this reproduction, but it's exquisite. And then bottom right is more self-indulgence um, because apparently talent is genetic. And that is my son's very first um, lesson in uh, portraiture from three or four years ago. And I keep that on my phone because I love it so much. And, okay, Daniel, you're up. For me, some of my favorite artwork outside the museum is, are the late Baroque paintings of Giovanni Battista Tiepolo. And some of you may have heard of him. He was an Italian painter who created these phenomenal ceilings that graced the uh, churches and palaces of 18th century Europe. And he was Venetian, and he went all around Europe. He's, he did many commissions in Italy, but he painted this fabulous staircase in the Würzburg residence in Germany. And the image on the left is the oil sketch for the ceiling in the Episcopal Palace in Würzburg. It dates from 1752 to 53, and it's really an outstanding painting, a tour de force showing Apollo on the four continents. And, as a grad student, I went here and I was just absolutely blown away by There's this. There's nothing like a Tiepolo ceiling. There's nothing like a Tiepolo ceiling. At the Jacques Mar andre if anyone's been to the Musée Jacques Mar andre their cafe has a Tiepolo ceiling and it's just, an, you know, amazing to be able to sit there and have your cup of tea there. Absolutely. You're transported to another world in these kind of paintings. And then for me, I really, my heart is in the 19th century in many regards. I am very fond of here is a, an image of uh, a late work by Caspar David Friedrich. It's beautiful um, and it shows basically the stages of life. It's not far off from when the painter died. He's one of the most famous German romantic landscapists. And I just love the light in his paintings. I love the mystery of them and the mood that they establish. Uh, another artist who's not a household name, British John Atkinson Grimshaw. This is one of his autumn scenes from the late 19th century. I'm very fond of Victorian painting. And I also like Orientalist painting. This is by Jean-Léon Jérôme. I worked on a picture show. Yes. <laughs> but I also have a great love for early 20th century modernism. That's how I entered the field of art history. That's where my interest developed in art. And this is one of Paul Clay's beautiful uh, paintings based upon going to the carnival. <laughs> Paul Clay was painting. Swiss German modernist. So I'm very fond of his art. Okay, and uh, this is the postcard <laughs> that, that I did. We, we, when we were hashing out this program, um, we realized we needed to put a little bit about some of the living artists that we had met in here. So um, I, I could talk, you know, an entire hour about it, but um, 
you can go ahead and go forward, Daniel, and we'll see. So this is Isabel de Borschgrav. Um, she is a Belgian artist who um, is best known for the dresses that she, full scale dresses that she makes out of paper, um, sort of giant sculptures. And I went to her studio, I think it was five years ago, basically this week or last week, it was coming up in my social media memories. And we worked with the Dixon and the Oklahoma City Museum and the Society of the Arts in Palm Beach to do a tour of her work. So getting to go and be in her studio with this museum um, consortium and get, be there from the first moments of planning the show was really delightful. And I took this picture of her working while we were there. So you can um, go ahead and go forward, Daniel. And, and there is an installation shot of some of her gowns in with the 18th century paintings at the Frick, which made it, I think, the best venue on the tour because we had a collection that supported the work and we could integrate it um, to an extent uh, in a way that other museums couldn't. I'm go ahead and move to the next. And um, in, it's, he's been called a trickster, smart aleck, magician, shaman, whatever form he's in tonight, we're glad he's with us. Please welcome Vic Muniz. That was my introduction from, I think, 2013. I worked with Vic in 2000 on, a, on our first residency, and he created an exhibition called Clayton Day's Picture Stories by Vic Muniz, which was meant to be a kind of storybook. And if people know his work, he is a trickster. And so what he did is he had everybody dress in costume and shoot photos that looked like they were taken in the 19th century. And he mixed them in with some real photos, six or seven real photos and like 58 new photos or something like that, that were sort of fabrications of history. So um, here I am with him in 2013, we brought him back and restaged the exhibition because I had been pregnant. I'd been the project manager left on maternity leave and had to hand the project to someone else. And I felt like I really wanted to, and the Frick acquired all the work. So in 2013, in honor of it being a Carnegie International year, um, we restaged it to have some contemporary art. And Vic had just won the Oscar for you know best documentary film for um, the film Wasteland about his work in the, in the garbage dumps of Rio. Um, and we borrowed some of that new work. So we restaged our show and borrowed new work. So in the picture, this is 2013 with me and Vic. And you can move forward, just kind of click through these, give a couple minutes. But that's, um, so in 2000, there was actually another documentary film crew documenting his work for a film called Worst Possible Illusion. And this is stills from that film as they show Vic photographing me and my son, Nathaniel, who was five months old. What you can't tell is that it's 38 degrees <laughs> and my baby's naked. Um, and uh, there were people standing with big blankets to just, as soon as the exposure was done, to just sw swab us in uh, warmth because it was really cold. And you can go forward and see. So I am incredibly privileged to have had a portrait taken by Vic Muniz. And I actually got to write the label for my own portrait <laughs> of, of Vic Muniz. And I put it on the cover of the book. So the second book, we did a little booklet. And I was like, I'm putting my kid on the cover of this booklet. So indulgences um, that I have made over the years. But you can go ahead and move forward. Um, there's a little, that's some of his, the work he did, pictures of magazines. Um, that's Kaibox floor scrapers um, rendered in fragments of magazines, massively heavy, like incredibly challenging to hang those. Um, you can go on. And I think that's it for me. Yes, I, I will uh, bring up a couple of artists once we move a little bit forward. Okay. Um, that I've been able to work with. Okay. And I don't want to focus on problems. So we will <laughs> we will go fast <laughs> here. I'll tell you, go, go to the next step. Did you want to say something more right now? Um, you go ahead and then I'll follow. <laughs> no, I was going to say, we'll see some images of the most difficult installation I managed in a moment, but we won't dwell on them. So <laughs> you can talk now. Yes. I, I had an opportunity to work with quite a few living artists at the New Britain Museum of American Art. And um, one of them that was very interesting, he's not living anymore, but deceased not that long ago was Saul LeWitt. And mm -hmm. uh, that was really an interesting experience. Saul LeWitt, as some of you probably know, he's a renowned minimalist. But he grew up in Connecticut, and he operated his studio in Chester, Connecticut. But he grew up in New Britain and had a special love for the New Britain Museum of American Art. And so after so much uh, work in, and uh, training to negotiate with this artist, uh, Douglas Highland, the former director, finally convinced him to bequeath part of his art collection to the museum. 
but it took quite some doing. But working with Saul was really an outstanding opportunity. And one of his wall drawings graces the lobby of the museum. And these are just some materials from the opening of the museum back in 2006 when we added this Chase family building. Really an outstanding and exciting project included a yeah, cafe yeah. and a refurbishment of the historical Landers house off here to the right. So that was really a formative experience. And here in this photo, you can see the drawing that was executed by Saul Studio, his assistants. Mm -hmm. Some views of the galleries after they were done with Hudson River School paintings and 19th century genre paintings and portraits. It's a very extensive collection. And then a commissioned piece that was in the Grand Staircase by an artist named Stefan Hendy, who has now moved on to do some really interesting uh, site-specific work. That's a key and, photo. Yeah, and these are the upstairs galleries, the, the Changing Exhibitions Gallery. And then also back here, a great artist I had a chance to work with named Graydon Parrish. And you might, some of you might have heard of him. Graydon Parrish used to work up in um, Western Massachusetts. And he did this very large mural that you see in this picture commemorating 9-11. And that was quite a to-do with the museum. It took him so long to paint this huge work, which was probably eight by 15 feet. And uh, it's a very large allegory. But that was very memorable. And here, I, I will not, I, many challenging projects over the years, but the most difficult exhibition installation was this uh, undress, the history of underwear and fashion from the Victorian Albert Museum that we had. And everything had to be, you know, behind glass. And so building this casework was essentially like having a small house built inside the museum over, you know, a, a very, in a very rapid time period between exhibitions. So I was there many late nights with, you know, overseeing the contractors, trying to speed things along. I did a lot of cleaning myself just to keep things moving forward for them. And on the bottom right, um, it's just, if anybody knows Stacy London, she came in to talk about fashion. I did not know her. Amanda Gillen, if she's on this call somewhere, <laughs> my colleague back at the Frick was a big fan of Stacey London, coordinated getting her into Pittsburgh. It was a really fun event and it was lovely walking through the show with her. Amanda chimes in, I'm here. Um, and this is, you know, some of the tough projects um, involved the, taking care of an old house. Everybody knows taking care of houses is a pain in the butt. Um, and then you have, um, you know, a house built somewhere between 1860 and 1870 with additions put on um, in 1893 and um, 1897 and, you know, 100 plus years of use and, you know, thousands of visitors going through each year. It takes a lot of upkeep. So we both, the bottom right, the call for the ceiling there, actually Amanda and I uh, worked really closely with contractors who had to take that part apart piece by piece, like a jigsaw puzzle, numbering everything to be able to put it back the way it was in order to add an extra steel beam because Henry Clay Frick's bathroom that was added in 1897 was making that roof sag um, after 100 years. And then the other thing we basically, you know, recently, not too long before I left, completed rebuilding the foundation under the porch, which was the kind of highlighted um, uh, section of the other photo here. So um, things also fall under the things I didn't expect to be doing in my career. Um, I can go ahead and move forward from there. <laughs> a little travel, but we should do a whole nother program on travel. Maybe we should, maybe we should agree to do that. Yes. Um, okay, so you could go ahead and move forward and that's yeah. China though. You should talk about China. <laughs> yes, uh, it, towards the end of my time at the New Burton Museum of American Art, I was asked to do a courier trip to China for this exhibition that was organized by the Guggenheim Museum in New York called Art in America, 300 Years of Innovation. And that involved going over to the National Museum of Art in Beijing, China, and overseeing the unpacking of crates in the dead of winter in Beijing uh, before um, the air quality there was not so great. And that was a really interesting experience for me to go over there and see how the Chinese officials and uh, colleagues at that museum went about this installing this kind of exhibition. And it was really a, f a fabulous experience for me. I met lots of people from all over the U.S., but also all over China who were gathered there at that time. And we were there for about four days. 
And then I sort of extended the trip after the museum business was completed and spent some time in Shanghai. So it was really uh, quite something. And two of the New Burton Museum's paintings traveled to that. It was a huge um, uh, still life by Richard Labari Goodwin, an artist we also have in the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts, and then a William Merritt Chase portrait that uh, traveled over there. Other journeys after I left the New Burton Museum, well, one of the most important, and, and that was when I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is in East Central Illinois, and went to grad school to get my MA and my PhD. This also was a time where I had an internship in 2010 at the Phillips Collection in Washington, DC, because at that time, the UIUC and the Phillips Collection had a collaboration. Unfortunately, that program closed for a variety of reasons, but I had a chance to intern at the Phillips and uh, work with director Dorothy Kaczynski there, as well as several curators. It was a fabulous um, time, and the collection is just so deep at the Phillips. It has some parallels with our museum, too. And then also, as a grad student, I worked at the Cranard Art Museum on different kinds of projects and also went over there to study the collections. It's a very nice university, medium-sized museum and uh, lovely campus. And this is a picture here of the main quad at UIUC. And coming back to more influential people in my life, my career, here we have my PhD dissertation advisor, David O'Brien, with whom I still keep in touch. He was most recently a fellow at the National Gallery of Art at the Center for the Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts, or CASBA. Mara Wade, who was on my dissertation committee, head of the German department at the university, Vernon Hyde Minor, who inspired me to study 18th century Italian painters north of the Alps. And then Lisa Rosenthal, who was also on my committee and was a great um, mentor in how we study allegory in Baroque art. So these people were really important in shaping my thinking. And it is that to them I, I owe the origin of my book that I published in 2016 called Exuberant Apotheoses, Italian Frescoes in the Holy Land Empire. So from there, my travels took me to here in Maryland, where I moved uh, when my wife got a job here in Ellicott City. And before I came to Hagerstown, I was teaching at the Howard Co County Community College Art History and also for University of Maryland Global Campus down in Adelphi, Maryland, and Marymount University in Arlington. And then I found the job at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts in 2017. And hopefully you're not pulled between so many places. Um, so this is um, a little romantic indulgence for me um, to, in terms of travel. There's a lot of trips I could talk about, but in 2010, I spent a week in Paris um, with Isabel Tubby, who is an American art historian. Um, and I had hired her at the Frick to um, work on an exhibition of Walter Gay paintings. Um, he did, um, he was an American artist who painted interiors, um, loved the Rococo. Um, he and his wife lived in France and he would paint the interiors of chateaus and he was hired by the Fricks to do some interior views of the Frick collection, which actually are in the Pittsburgh Frick. And so we mounted this, this exhibition, which was um, nicely funded by the Von Hess um, uh, Foundation. And uh, at the time, dear Bill Bodine, you know, said to me, this needs a research trip to Paris and you and Isabel will go. Um, he, he, I think he actually said, you know, I want, my my curator to go as well as our guest curator and it was wonderful being there for a week with Isabel and I think the best thing was this idea that I was in Paris and I was working you know like I had to get up in the morning and I had appointments and I had places to go and we were having breakfast with the businessmen um, and uh, I wrote a blog that um, is no longer online but it was really fun it was up for a while and people would let, write me fan mail um, and these were the notes and this is I picked sort of semi-romantic pages of the notes to uh, to share and then I would turn them into a blog at night. So I was hardly sleeping because I was trying to get these blog posts to our media team in Pittsburgh. Um, and you can see um, some funny, funny things here. Um, one of the private collectors said to me on the phone, um, let me hear you tell me what you'll tell the taxi driver. She was concerned about my French and uh, for me to get to the 16e arrondissement. And uh, when I said it back, she's like, oh, well, you know some French. And uh, 
So anyway, that, that made it into my memories as well as the little thing here. Um, back at the hotel, I ordered a taxi for the morning in my room. I packed my bags with my coat on and windows wide open to feel a part of Paris a little longer. So I actually love that I made all these notes that are a little personal and sometimes veer into the poetic because they really do bring that back to life for me. Um, and you can go to the next slide and here we are. Um, <laughs> So I put a picture of food up here. <laughs> so my creative, I do a lot of vegetarian cooking. If anybody follows me on social media, I am one of those annoying people with food pictures. Um, and I also do a little bit of knitting and crocheting, and, um, but not terribly well. Um, and, I, and I love to read and listen to music. And uh, so that's, that's enough of my white beans. You can, <laughs> can move on. Okay, did you, would you have a creative outlet, Daniel? Sort of, yeah. I, I find myself often in my, at least these days in my free time, doing different kinds of research projects, often publishing essays or articles or doing reviews. So I find a, a sort of the outlet is through writing and doing more research. Well, you truly love your job then, right? I, I, I do. And I also enjoy traveling and um, also spending time with, with friends and um, sightseeing. More so, of course, pre-COVID. <laughs> so I mentioned already some things I never expected to do. It's about five to seven, I think. So we should see if there's questions that we should respond to. And uh, are there any like really amazing images in those last few slides that uh, that's that actually goes with the trip to Paris. That's the Port de Lyon at the Louvre where I had one of my appointments to go in and look at some watercolors. And look, it's Daniel. I think that's maybe the best part of the job, what you're doing right there. Absolutely, yeah. That's me for, uh, giving a gallery talk for the BAM exhibition that we had several years ago of uh, really fun works by various uh, illustrators and authors of uh, uh, there were manga books in there and Jared Krasowska and it's all kinds of very fun things in there circulated from the Children's Museum in um, Abilene, Texas. I had a, one of my very poetic lists of things uh, that are the favorite parts of the job, unpacking the crates, you know, getting that glimpse of things. Being in a museum alone or being in a museum when it's closed is uh, one, amazing, wonderful. But I think connecting people to the museum is really the best part. If you've got a group and you're talking to them, and, and we have a group today, <laughs> but, but we just can't see you, um, and, and you make connections with them, it really, it's a great feeling. It's Absolutely. That is one of the most rewarding parts, is sharing your findings and your insights about art with a wide audience. Get, getting people to... Um, make discoveries on their own too and find pleasures they never expected for sure. So I think that's the end of our slideshow, isn't it? It is. And, um, okay. So um, do we have questions, Kelly and Jillian, in the chat that we should answer real quickly before we say goodnight? I actually don't see questions, but there's been a little side conversation about everybody's favorite um, paintings and artwork that we have at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. So if anybody wants to get a chance and just kind of stroll, uh, scroll through the chat and see what everybody's ideas are, it's kind of fun to do. But I don't see any major questions, if anybody has any right now. Um, and I think I saw in the Q&A, which we forgot to tell people, you know, there's a Q&A box and there's a chat box and we are kind of watching the chat. But earlier, I think in the Q&A, someone had said, do, does it have to be your collection? I think that probably has to do with our discussion topics. Um, I guess I would say, I don't really want us to spend an hour talking about someone else's painting, but we can talk about, um, uh, you know, we could talk about an art style or a movement that encompasses or folds that into our collection somehow. I think we could probably find a way to do it and connect it to um, our collection. What do you think, Daniel? Yes, absolutely. I think that would be a lot of fun and very interesting. Okay. Well, I guess I will say to everyone, um, I really enjoyed this. I did get to know a lot more about Daniel than I knew before. And um, I, I 
I enjoyed myself. So I hope everybody else had a good time as well. Um, do let us know if you have other ideas. Um, remember Washington County Gives on Tuesday and, you know, shoot us an email if um, we close this down and you think of something tomorrow and you want to get in touch. Um, that's fine. I'm SJ Hall at WCMFA.org. So you can find us. Yes, and uh, you can reach me at curator at WCMFA.org. And it, this was great, Sarah. It was nice uh, and interesting getting to know more about your background and how you got interested in museums and art. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody.